there. You're listening to the Bigfoot Society podcast, and I'm Jeremiah Byron. Every week, I talk to individuals who have experienced Sasquatch in some way or another, so you won't want to miss an episode. Make sure you're subscribed on the platform that you're listening to and share this episode with a friend. It does not cost a thing, and it helps the show continue to grow. If you'd like to hear Bigfoot Society episodes early and ad-free, you can do so by becoming a Patreon supporter or a YouTube channel member. Links to those are in the show notes. And Bigfoot Society, I've taken far too much of your time so far, so let's get on with the show. Place with my neighbor who was pretty kooky. Um... It was probably about 1986 or 80, about 1986, I guess. That's about when it happened. Just came over to me out of the blue and just handed me this book and wanted to know if I believed in Bigfoot. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And do you, do I wish you I could remember? figure out who that guy was. Yeah, exactly. You were saying that it was an old Oregon logger that had written that pamphlet about how he was had Bigfoot on his property. Or do you remember anything about the story that was contained inside the booklet? One of the, one of the things that he said in the booklet, I think it happened, it, it, it was... It had to do with his uh, his first encounter with uh, with Bigfoot, and um, said he he lived up in the um, lived up in the woods somewhere in Oregon and in a travel trailer, and there were a lot of logging roads up there. Um, I know my wife and I were thinking about buying a house up there in Florence, uh, Oregon, and I and. I know the real estate guy took us around and man, we were, we were on dirt roads and there's just roads everywhere out there, you know, that they, they cut for, for, for all these logging operations that they had going. But anyway, one of the things that he, he was, that he talked about early on in this booklet and it got, it got me to thinking about the size of, uh, of Sasquatch is that he said he was out for some kind of a little evening stroll down one of his logging roads uh, near where he was staying in his travel trailer, little travel trailer. And he said he stopped to kind of look over the countryside and he, and his, um, his eyes were drawn to this creature that was standing behind a stump uh, of, a, of a large tree that had been cut down and he said this uh, this creature was standing behind the stump and about um he could see the he could see the creature from the top of his head down to about i say about the middle of his chest and the rest of it was concealed by the the, the stump and this and that's so he was looking down downhill through this uh clear cut uh forest and uh so he was watching this thing and then he said he turned his eyes away and he looked back and the thing was gone so at some some point um in the in the you know shortly after that occurred maybe the next day or something like that he went down to that stump where um he had seen that creature and he said he he was himself like six two or six three, and he stood behind the stump, and the top of the stump was maybe a couple of feet above the above the top of his head, so it made that sasquatch about eleven or twelve feet high, and so that's how he kind of opened up the in the in early parts of this book, and then he somehow and I can't remember how. It's been so many. It's it's been almost forty years. Uh, he he made uh, friends with this family of Sasquatch, and they took him took him to uh, what he referred to as the fifth dimension. And he said he could actually look back on on people in our dimension, which is a three dimension, third dimension, and he had just all kinds of things to 
say that, you know, about that kind of stuff. And it was just, um, it was pretty far out stuff. And, and, uh, but the guy, the guy stood by what he said because I called him up on the phone and, uh, asked him who he was. And he told me who he was. And I talked to him for about an hour and the guy, the guy was definitely convincing, but, and very sincere and didn't, didn't sound at all delusional, but, um, you know, it just makes you wonder, you know, about maybe what the extraterrestrial powers of these things might be. Do all of them have these powers or is just some of them have these powers? It's, you know, who, who knows? It's just, you know, something we can talk about and speculate about. But I don't know anybody that has ever, ever talked to me personally about what this old man, this old logger talked to me about. It's very interesting. So listeners, if you know what this pamphlet is, it's about 50, 65 pages, and we're not sure who the guy's name is, but if you're listening and you know what this pamphlet is, let me know. You can email me or put it in the YouTube comments and then I'll uh, let uh, Mr. Black know. Uh, Cause I'm sure, I mean, I would like to know, I'm sure he would, like to know as well but uh that's a very interesting side story about uh uh, something that happened during the 80s but to to let the listeners know um so you contacted me sir quite a while ago and we've been going back and forth via email uh, about that you've had an encounter that took place uh in 1958 in northern california and uh, we finally gotten to the point where we're able to chat about it on the phone and to be able to share, uh, so you can share what happened. But um, I first want to say thank you for for coming on the line tonight uh, to share what happened to you back in the fifties. But uh, yeah, I just uh, the floor is yours, sir. I grew up in uh, Northern California in a place called Lake County. It's about a hundred and twenty miles north of San Francisco, in the in the mountains of uh in the it's in the coastal mountain range of california uh, lake county is surrounded by napa county on the south which everybody knows is you know heavily uh, wine country uh, sonoma county also uh, wine country mendocino county pretty much the same thing uh calusa county and glen county And uh, now um, Lake County, when I grew up in the 50s, uh, was predominantly uh, walnut orchards, pear orchards, cattle and sheep ranches. And there was a large resort um, uh, community that surrounded uh, the Clear Lake, which is the largest freshwater lake in California. Lake County was very sparsely populated in the 50s. uh, the, the population of the county was probably about 17,000. And uh, I went to high school in Kelseyville and graduated from Kelseyville High. And my senior class only had 42 students in it. So it just gives you an idea how small a community and how sparsely populated the county was. My dad was uh, during World War II worked for a mining company in Clear Lake. It was a a quicksilver mining operation and they supplied quicksilver, which from that you get mercury. And and so after World War II, um, he bought some uh, a bulldozer and a pickup and he was clearing land for some wealthy ranchers from Southern California and they were gonna plant walnut orchards in this very brushy, rugged part of Lake County. And when my father was done clearing off this one piece of land, which was about 400 acres, they asked him if he wouldn't be the general manager and be in charge of planting it as a walnut orchard. So I grew up on the on a on a ranch that was uh, had 400 acres in walnuts, and then it had about 800 acres 
in open pasture land where we ran cattle. So fast forward to 1958, and um, my brother and I um, listened to my dad talk about how he wanted to irrigate his orchard 24 hours a day. So we hired all these people from surrounding counties and, and cities and towns and none of them worked out. They were all a bunch of alcoholics and they drank on the job and they did terrible work. And so I had to fire them all. So my brother and I uh, went to my dad and said, Hey, listen, if you want to continue your irrigation you know, project here where you want to irrigate the orchard 24 hours a day, we can do that job. And my dad thought we were a little too small to do that. I was 14. My brother was about 12. And we um, had a friend by the name of Jack who is deceased and my brother is now deceased. And um, so we, we convinced my dad that we could do the job. And so we um, set up a schedule where we were uh, moving this irrigation pipe through the orchard 24 hours a day, and every eight hours, we would move the irrigation pipe 40 feet. So this one night, it would happen to be a Sunday night, and it was about 7 o'clock at night, and we had just gotten done uh, moving all this irrigation pipe, and we were driving around the orchard where we had uh, moved this when I when I talk about this irrigation pipe, it, it was about two miles of irrigation pipe. So it was a considerable job that took several hours to accomplish. So anyway, we were driving around the orchards. We had all these ranch roads that uh, kind of uh, dissected the orchard into 40-acre parcels. So we're driving around, the three of us in this old Chevy pickup, ranch pickup. And as I came to the end of one field and made a right turn and was driving along, uh, my brother and Jack said to me, hey, stop the pickup because we see somebody walking in the orchard. And there shouldn't have been anybody in the orchard. Nobody worked on Sunday night except my brother and Jack and I. My mom and dad were at home across the across the property about a, about three quarters of a mile home at uh, in the ranch house and so i slowed the pickup down and kind of uh pulled off the side of the road and i could look back in the orchard we could all look back in the orchard about 75 or 100 feet and we could see somebody walking back in, in, the, in the orchard. We could only see them from about the waist down because of the low hanging limbs and branches of the, uh, of the walnut trees. So as soon as I pulled the truck over and stopped so we could get a better look at what it was back there in the orchard that was walking along, whoever it was, and we couldn't identify it at the time, started running across the, through the orchard. So I took off and we were kind of paralleling this thing for a while. And uh, Jack and my brother were telling me where this thing was running. And so it was about a quarter mile down to our barns and our shop. And at that point I made a right turn and that, and the orchard from that point, the road was very steep is about 12, 14, 15 degree uh, incline. And we could, they could see this, this creature, whatever it was, and they said it was pretty good size. It looked like a pretty good sized man. They didn't know what it was uh, running through the orchard. What we thought it was, was an escaped um, convict, like a trustee that lived in the um, uh, Department of Forestry uh, firefighting camp, which was about a mile and a half as the crow would fly from our ranch. There were no fences. There were, there were, they, they had people um, working there uh, that were forestry personnel. They kind of kept track of these people, 
but since there was uh, no, there were no fences, these people could wander off. We thought it was one of those people that uh, had escaped and was uh, running through the orchard. And uh, so anyway, we went up. So I drove the truck up up this uh, ranch road, and it's pretty steep. And we got there was an owner's property, an owner's house up the halfway up this hill, and we went about a hundred or two hundred yards past that, and we stopped at a point where we thought we were going to intersect with this person that we thought it must be a person that was running through the orchard. So we stopped the truck. We all got out. All three of us got out and we're just waiting on the side of the road. And we're kind of standing by the right front fender of the pickup. And we could hear this thing coming through the orchard, but we couldn't see it because of the trees. And it sounded like um, a horse running through the orchard. It was bipedal, but the sound of this thing breathing, it sounded just like my horse, my brother and I both had horses and uh, just sounded like them when they were breathing heavily. And so we just waited there and waited there until finally we saw what this thing was as it came out of the, uh, it came out of the orchard. And as it came up higher in the orchard, the soil was not as good a soil. And so the trees we're not nearly as big of trees as the down lower on them on the hill. And so when this came out of the trees, we could see that it was about seven to seven and a half feet tall, probably weighed in the neighborhood of 500, 550 pounds or more. And this thing was clomping along at probably about a, a, a four foot stride uh and it was it, it had been running through uh an area that had been pre that had just been uh irrigated so it was very very deep and muddy and then above that it had been cultivated about 12 or 14 inches deep and this thing was running through that stuff at a pretty good pace and i at about what i consider about a a three to four foot stride which is more than any man i think could uh could do in that in that heavy mud and and that in that steep grade and as this thing kept getting closer to us we got a, a real good look at this thing and this particular creature is not the kind uh i've listened to other podcasts where people describe these uh, sasquatch creatures as having a shoulder width of up to four to five feet, but this creature wasn't like that. This creature was um, tall, seven, seven and a half feet tall, very heavy, but uh, very muscular, but not wide in the shoulders like that. And as this thing got closer to us, why it, when it, when it kind of turned to look directly at us, it had to kind of turn its body. Didn't its head look like this, it looked like the shoulders kind of went from the edge of the, the tip of the shoulders up to where the ears might be on the skull. It just looked like, you know, what I would, at the time, it looked like, you know, some of the football players that I, I would see on TV, I guess. But this thing kind of grinned at us as it came closer, didn't show us any teeth, just grinned at us, and it never slowed down. It never made any any threatening gesture toward us. It just it had its facial features look like uh, that of an Indian. So it had a humanoid kind of facial features. It was covered in hair. Head to, it it had a it had a round head. Didn't have a conical head. Uh, there was not a. Uh, it had a heavy brow ridge. The forehead, uh, it the hairline came down within maybe an inch or two of the brow line. Uh, there was no hair on on its face, uh, on its neck, and under its ears, and and I couldn't even see its ears. 
And uh, as this thing came up the hill past us, uh, my brother and Jack wanted to get back in the truck and they wanted to get the hell out of there because this thing scared them. I have no idea why I wanted to stick around and watch this thing go by. But once it went by us and continued up the hill, we got back in the truck and we waited a, a little bit, just maybe a minute or so, watched this thing as it kept going up the hill. And it didn't have to go much further up the hill until it intersected another uh, four-way intersection of, of our ranch roads. And so I started the pickup up, and I started up the hill in this old 41 Chevy. And it, it made a lot of racket. It had a straight pipe, no muffler. And uh, this thing, we're grinding up. the. We're not talking about a, uh, a muscle car here. This is old 41 Chevy with a little stick cylinder. And we were grinding up the hill, and this thing made a lot of transmission noise. And so when this thing got to the, this creature got to the intersection of the, at the top of the hill where these four ranch roads came together, why it turned and tried to look back at where we were coming up the hill. And in order to do that, it had to torque its, its body completely around because it, it didn't seem to be able to turn its neck. And so it, it went across the intersection that went into, uh, kind of entered another section, 40 uh, acre section of walnut trees. And it kind of crossed that uh, section at a diagonal. And that, that, uh, that part of the orchard was pretty flat for a couple hundred yards. And then it dropped off in what I would think is about uh, 14 or 15 degree downhill slope. So I had to drive all the way around on these ranch roads to try to keep in sight of this thing. And so the more that we tried to keep up with it, the more this thing started to run. And as it was running down this hill through the orchard, um, I would estimate that it was running at about 25 or 30 miles an hour. And its stride at that point was maybe 10, 10, 15 feet or something like that. And when we finally got down to the hill, this thing crossed the road that we were on, never looked at us, never gave us a, a glance at that point, ran across the road in front of us, and it ran across that road into the property of a of a neighbor who also had a walnut orchard. They didn't, nobody lived there at the time, but they had some barns and some equipment sheds. And this, this creature ran in between their barns and their equipment shed, and then ran another hundred yards or so. And at the, at where the walnut orchard met the brush line and the tree line, this thing just charged into the brush and the brush was maybe 15, 18 feet high. It just went through that brush like a bulldozer, never even slowed down. And at that point, we lost, we lost track of, um, of this creature. So my brother and Jack and I had a conversation about whether or not we were going to tell my dad about this encounter. And we had lobbied my dad pretty hard for about a month to let us uh, take on this job of uh, moving the irrigation bike. We made good money. He paid us. He paid us what what he paid those guys that never showed up or drank on the job and did a bad job. He made he paid us just as well as he paid those guys. And so we didn't want to lose that job. It was a great job. It was better than doing other jobs on the ranch that we didn't like to do. So we decided that we wouldn't, that we wouldn't tell my dad. And, um, I, I failed to mention that the time of, of, uh, the time of the year that this was, was in late July of 1958. And, um, the deer season in Lake County opens up this, this first Saturday of, uh, August every year. And so when I started carrying uh, 
a Winchester rifle in our ranch truck, I just told my dad, I said, if I see a deer out here, you know, while we're changing pipe, and I can get a good shot at a deer, you know, I'll, I'll shoot it. And I was going to shoot a deer, but that's not the reason I was carrying that rifle because I was afraid that thing was going to come back. I really, I really didn't know what it was that I saw. I had never heard anybody in my circle of family or friends. I'd never heard anybody ever talk about a creature that was over seven feet tall, covered in hair, um, bipedal, you know, um, never, never heard anything that, uh, would even lead me to believe. I never heard the word, uh, Sasquatch or Bigfoot that never had entered my, uh, vocabulary. Never heard anybody talk about that. And so as we continued on through the summer, move an irrigation pipe and, and working in the orchard at night, we had these headlights like a, uh, they were like a head lantern, uh, powered by a six volt battery, small six volt battery, kind of like a miner would wear in a, in a mining tunnel or something. And I can tell you that all summer long, when it was out there in the dark, I always felt like I was being watched. Maybe it was just my imagination, but I would, I would, Sometimes the, 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 the feeling of being washed just was so overpowering that I would look around with my headlight to see my headlamp to see if I could see if there was anything out there watching me. And I never, I never, uh, I never could never saw anything that, that, uh, that was, that was out there in the dark with us, but it, uh, it, it, it most certainly spooked us, but, uh, we decided that we weren't going to tell my dad because we didn't, we thought that he would think that it might be too dangerous for, for us little guys to be out there in the dark. And so, you know, we didn't want to lose our job. So anyway, fast forward about a year and my dad, uh, my dad uh, subscribed to a publication called true magazine. And one of the publications in, I think it was 1959, was about the, um, the episode um, encounter, I guess you will, of a guy by the name of Jerry Crew. And Jerry Crew was a bulldozer operator in, uh, over in Humboldt County. I think it's Humboldt County. Might be Del Norte County. But anyway, it's up in uh, what is now uh, Bigfoot country in the Trinity, what's called the Trinity Alps. It's a very rugged part of uh, Northern California. It borders the Oregon, uh, California border. And uh, Jerry Crew, as a bulldozer operator, he worked for a company that had a contract with some logging companies to build some logging roads back in in the uh, area uh, surrounding Willow Creek. And Willow Creek is, uh, if you visit there is certainly uh, steeped in a lot of Bigfoot mythology. And there's, uh, there's a big redwood tree that's been carved by somebody with a chainsaw into a great big Sasquatch. And there's a museum there. And if you go into the restaurant, the menu is all kinds of, full of all kinds of Bigfoot menu choices, you know? And uh, so anyway, crew and his, uh, lived over in the uh, Sacramento Valley area somewhere. So on the, on Friday night, he would go home. And, uh, so he would, uh, when he came back to work on Monday to, uh, fire up his cat, the, um, bulldozer and build roads, he started seeing these big, uh, uh, barefoot tracks in the powdery, uh, dirt roads that they were, you know, the logging roads that they were building. And so they um, they made I think they made a plaster uh, cast of these footprints, and at some point they uh, contacted some people in Eureka, California. That was near, it's close by, maybe 50, 60 miles away, I guess. 
and at the, at the newspaper, the local newspaper. And, and uh, I think one of the editors or the editor of that newspaper was retired from the Los Angeles Times and uh, kind of thought that the story that uh, Jerry Crew told him about these big footprints that he saw all over the construction site, you know, and the plaster cast that he brought to him, I think, and kind of dismissed it as a kind of an odd um, story, maybe maybe not too believable. But then after about a week or so or some time went by, he the editor picked up this um, picked up the story and uh, and then published it. And eventually it made its way, that story made its way through a lot of different newspapers uh, throughout California and throughout the United, Western United States, I guess. And eventually it ended up in True Magazine. So my dad had been reading this article about all the stuff that Jerry Crew had been reporting. And uh, so I saw that, I saw that, you know, what my dad was reading. So they had they had a kind of a sketch of what this thing looked like and when i saw the sketch then i knew what i saw i remembered back a year before or so and what i saw in true magazine is what i saw on the ranch that night that sunday night in the in the latter part of july of 58 and so I never, we, we, we still never told my dad. So it was maybe a year or so later, um, maybe in the next year, why my uh, dad had gotten contacted by his younger brother. And my uncle was um, the general manager of a 4,000 acre sheep ranch in Sonoma County out it was out within, I think it was in about within about 18 or 20 miles of the of uh, the Pacific uh, coast, and this little town of uh, Guadalajara and some other places out there, very small, very small place. Anyway, uh, my uncle had invited my dad and some other friends of his uh, out on the sheep ranch to go wild hog hunting. So my dad was out there for three or four days and. And they sh he shot this this big hog. It was about maybe 450 pounds. And so he brought home these big slabs of pork. And they each weighed, oh, I don't know, 75, 80 pounds, maybe 100 pounds. I don't know. So he brought these big slabs of pork home. Not sure what we were going to do with 150, 200 pounds of pork. But anyway, brought it home. And um, at night, the first night that he was home, why uh, we had these uh, on the back of our house, farmhouse, we had these big meat hooks that my dad had kind of uh, screwed into the ends of the roof rafters. And so when we would kill deer on the ranch, after we had uh, dressed out the deer, we would hang the deer out at night uh, on the back of the house. Well, that's what he did with these big slabs of this wild hog that he'd killed he hung these big slabs up there on these uh on these meat hooks well these hooks were about 11 feet off the ground and my dad was only about five five eight five eight and a half so in order to hang those those slabs of, of uh pork uh meat up there he had to get on a step ladder so the first night he hung the things up there and in the morning he took them down they wrapped them up in, in some old bed cloths and put them in a sleeping bag and put them underneath their, their bed where it was nice and cool. The following night, they take them out from underneath the bed, take them out of the sleeping bag, hang them out at night. So they planned to do that for about three nights. So on the third night, my dad hangs the meat out there. And the following morning, day four, he goes out there to take his uh, his wild hog meat off the back of the house, and it's missing. So my dad comes in, and I think my brother and I are sitting there eating breakfast or something. 
and he asks us, did you do something with the, with the meat on the back of the house? Answer is uh, no. We couldn't even, we were just little guys. We couldn't lift that stuff, you know. We get a, so anyway, my dad told me, he says, go get, he says, I bet the dog's got it. I said, dad, we don't have a single, we had about four or five dogs. I said, we don't have any dogs that can jump 11 feet. Not even if they got up on the porch and jumped up there, they, they, they wouldn't be able to. They, I said, and by the way, you know, and, and if a dog were to grab it or a coyote, we had coyotes, no wolves in, in Lake County, just coyotes. I said, if a coyote got it, they would just rip it off of there and probably try to eat it right there and just make a great big mess. So anyway, he made, dad asked me to go get all the dogs. So I get, I go and get all, we had about four or five dogs. So I go get all the dogs and I bring them around there. And that area by the back steps of our house near where that meat was hanging, those dogs would not, would not come even close to that. You, you could grab them by their collar and in order to get them over there, that area, you'd have to drag them. And these dogs were clearly uh, not willing to even come anywhere close to the back of that house. And there was, those dogs made no sound at night. They didn't, usually the, anybody that would come around, they would bark like crazy. But, you know, in the summertime, we didn't have any air conditioning way back in the, in the late 50s. So we slept with all the windows open. So if the dogs were going to bark, you're going to hear them. And so I knew, I was pretty sure what it was in my mind that came and took that meat off the back of the house. But um, we still, my brother and I uh, never, never said a, said a word about uh, any of our experiences or any of our encounter, encounters with, uh, with Bigfoot. About two years ago, I located uh, my old friend, uh, Jack, and, uh, he, he had, um, he had liver and, uh, colon cancer and he was very, very sick. And, um, I was very sad to hear that because I, I tried, I finally located, located him after all those years and, uh, tracked him down through friends. And I wanted to talk to him about what he remembered on the day we saw that Sasquatch in the orchard. And uh, I asked him if he if he would tell me uh, what his recollection of that time was. And he told me, he said, Norm, he said, I'm just too sick and too weak to even try to talk about it. And so... He died about three weeks later, four weeks later, and I never got to talk to him about uh, about his experiences on that day when my brother and he and I, you know, saw that creature coming out of the orchard. So, anyway, there was um, there was um, an episode on another podcast, and they um, there was a guy by the name of Mike Woolley had an episode or an encounter, I think it was up in the state of Washington. And so they posted a picture of what his Sasquatch looked like, his encounter looked like, and it was exactly what I saw. It was the, it was the face of an, this creature had the face of an Indian. It looked like, it didn't look like the Indian's from my neck of the woods there in Lake County or in that part of the, of California, it looked more like the Indians that you would see in the plains, in the plain, in the, the plain states, Nebraska, you know, Kansas, uh, South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, those kind of, those kinds of people. And, um, and so that, you know, and so later when I read about uh, this lady by the name of Melba Ketchum, who is a um, has a, a a DNA lab in Texas, 
I think she is herself a veterinarian, and she claims that from some hair samples and some other tissue samples that she may have collected from uh, a dozen or more sources around the United States, uh, she claims that the mitochondrial part of the DNA, the, the female side of the DNA, showed uh, a human female. But on the uh, male side of the DNA, it was uh, undetermined. So it got me to thinking about how closely the Sasquatch creatures, some of them, might be to humans to be able to possibly crossbreed with a with a male Sasquatch and a female uh, human. So it's just, there's no proof of that, I think, other than what Melba Ketchum uh, uh, says she, that she determined through her DNA testing. And of course, she is a very controversial person because um, she was not not successful in getting her study uh, published in any uh, peer peer to peer group uh, publication, and so it it uh, she she was criticized very heavily, and uh, and so a lot of people some people believe that her um, DNA testing is accurate while other people uh, discount it altogether. I know that there are people like um, uh, Kathy Strain and her husband, Bob. Um, her husband, Bob, I think is a retired firefighter. Kathy Strain is an anthropologist, works for the U.S. Department of Forestry in, uh, near Sonora in the, in the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains of uh, California, and she's had encounters with these creatures, I, as I understand, and, you know, written a lot of books um, where she interviewed a lot of Indian tribes across the nation. So it just depends, I guess, on what Indian tribe that you might uh, uh, talk to. Uh, some of them refer to them as cannibals, these Sasquatch creatures, creatures, creatures other talk about these creatures as people. And so there's a wide range of, uh, and I know that uh, the Indians up in British Columbia have a lot of contact with these things as well. So there, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting situation where we see these things, people report them, yet, we can find no evidence that uh, the physical evidence that they exist other than maybe the hair samples and the scat and some maybe uh, skin tissue or something that Melba Ketchum uh, came into uh, possession of. But I know what I saw. I know what my brother and I saw. And... Uh, Nobody can convince me that that creature is not flesh and blood and uh, and and real. Absolutely, Mister Black. That's but that's an incredible that's, story. That's my story. That wow. Thank you for for sharing. That, that's a lot to unpack from that. I do have a few uh, questions for you in a few minutes, but it's just there's a few observations I had from your story. So it's like you know happens back in uh, you said fifty uh, eight. Uh, before the Jerry Crew incidents, which happened up in Bluff Creek, which is about five and a half to six hours north of where Lake County is, I believe. And then you were talking about Sonoma, Sonoma County to the west. That's about eh, maybe two and a half hours where you had the issue with the wild hogs. So that's just so people can picture that in their minds where all this happened but um about the, the creature that you you saw back there in lake county do you remember anything specific about the arms of the creature at all this thing um when it when it was walking the arms were swinging and 
and the hands were down, down where the down by his knees, and his knees were not in the same spot as our knees. It their knees are lower on their legs, and when they walk, they don't walk like we do, and uh, they they have this kind of kind of um, when people walk, you know, or even if they run. They're bobbing up and down, but not these creatures. They don't do that. And, uh, and if you look at what, uh, uh, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin saw down in Bluff Creek, uh, you know, Patty, how she walked, that's how this creature walked, just kind of glided along. And, um, uh, unlike Patty, who looked like she had a pretty bad injury to her right leg, this creature that uh, we saw looked perfectly healthy to me and was going through the orchard at a, at a pace that no man could even begin to keep up with. Was there, was the creature wearing any clothes or no clothes? Was there hair on the body? Um, any details uh, uh, I, I did know. I did notice a, a San Francisco 49er baseball cap. <laughs> okay. No, I'm just kidding. All just right, kidding. Right. <laughs> you never know, right? Just kidding. Just kidding. I was a 49er fan when I was grew up as a kid, but no, no clothes, no nothing, just just hair, and uh, you know, it just. I could not see its ears. I don't know if these things got big ears, little ears, no ears. I don't know what they, I don't know what they have. Um, it, I noticed one of the things I noticed when it, when it, when it grinned, but it didn't show teeth, uh, is how wide the mouth was. I mean, it, it's, I mean, it's the, the, the opening for the mouth is way larger than a human being. And, uh, it, there was just, you know, there were just, um, when I saw this picture that, uh, was sketched out, uh, by, I, I don't know who, who, who sketched it out, but it was on this Mike Woolley, uh, encounter on another podcast. Um, that's, that's what, that's what clinched it for me. You know, uh, when I saw that picture, uh, you know, uh, in, the in the, uh, um, I know, I can't remember where, where I saw that uh, picture. I guess I missed, maybe I saw that on, on the podcast itself as, um, I think that's where I saw that, but the sketch that I saw in, uh, true magazine, uh, was very similar to what I saw, but more hair on the face, but it was similar enough that I knew that that's what I, I had seen that, the, that what I saw was a big foot also. After the the incident um, in Lake County, did you ever go back and try to look to at any of the tracks that were left uh, close up, anything like that? Well, you know, yeah, we we tried to we tried to we tried to see, you know, uh, what these tracks look like, but we're talking plowed ground and we're talking about freshly irrigated uh, soil in, in the orchard. And you just, you couldn't, it, it's just, there was just um, no way to, to really get a, get a, a an accurate uh, idea about a footprint. The, the, the foot, the footprint, you know, is it was about maybe 16 or 17 inches long, but the shape of it was, um, because the ground was plowed and, and other parts of the orchard where it came through that we looked, it was, it had been irrigated and it was muddy. You just couldn't tell. You couldn't tell the, the, the Sasquatch was sinking into the mud and into the plowed ground, at least, at least a foot. And, uh, and underneath that was just hard, hard, hard dirt. And, uh, so there was really no, you couldn't get an, you couldn't get a good picture as to the shape of the, of the footprint. You just couldn't. 
Yeah, absolutely. Something that heavy would definitely be sinking down, especially in an area where there's irrigation happening. That's such a such a very interesting uh, encounter. Uh, did you ever hear of any sightings in uh, from neighbors around that area, or hear of any other people in that area talking about seeing things as well? No. Okay. Not not a soul. Yeah. Wow. Not a soul. Later, later in life, I, um, uh, I joined the California highway patrol and, um, some of the guys I worked with in Los Angeles transferred up to, um, the Mount Shasta area. And so I, I, um, I, after, after I had, um, I retired from the highway patrol. I started uh, tracking down. I started thinking about this encounter that I had, you know, I'd started listening to some podcasts about Sasquatch. So I tracked down some of my old uh, workmates from my highway patrol days down in Los Angeles. And these guys were retired, but they had retired from up there by Mount Shasta. And they told me all kinds of stories about some of the encounters that, uh, that some of those guys had and um they never not one of them ever saw the creature all that they saw they saw footprints in the roads um one guy told me that they had a uh they had a big fire up there a big brush fire up in up in the area where he was working up in modoc i think it was mo either lassen or modoc county and uh so they were, uh, the fire was being uh, driven by about 30 mile an hour wind. So, I mean, every living creature, mountain lion, Sasquatch, uh, deer, uh, you name it, raccoon, whatever, they were all running for their life to try to outrun the fire. And they were using airplanes to try to control the fire. And so they're dropping this, this fire retardant, which is roughly about 8,000 gallons of water with all this red and purple fire retardant. So a lot of the areas along the, where the road, where these state highways, uh, two lane state highways kind of dissected this area where this, this big fire was, why these highway patrol guys that I know, they saw footprints, muddy footprints that went across the, uh, the state highway and the highway was, Oh, probably um, 60 feet wide or something like that paved paved area with the shoulders and everything about 60 feet wide. And they said that these, these footprints from what they thought was a Sasquatch, um, they cleared that, that, you know, that, that roadway in, in about three steps. So a very, a very large animal leaving a very large footprint and uh, cleared a very wide road in just a few steps. Yeah. So they're out there. I am not they're, surprised. They're out there. And I talked to some highway patrolmen that worked up in this area called Truckee. It's between, it's right on the, the Nevada, California line. And they have a big truck inspection facility there, the highway patrol. And these guys said that they see, they see these things all the time crossing the road. And, uh, but you never hear anybody talking about it because nobody talks about Bigfoot. If you want to get promoted on the job, or if you don't want to be criticized and made fun of, you don't, you don't, you don't talk about Bigfoot. I don't care if you've seen them, taken pictures of them, have proof of them. Nobody talks it. Nobody that I ever knew, except the, the very few people that I do know that worked up in those areas that I thought might have a, had a, an encounter. And some of them did come into contact with some, some evidence that those things exist like footprints, wet footprints across a road. Um, nobody's talking about that stuff. Oh, absolutely. And I, I've actually uh, taken a, uh, a gentleman called in one day with a, uh, I believe it was a sighting from the Truckee area. Uh, the ones you were talking about, are those recent or? No, these are, these were, uh, probably 20, 25 years ah, ago. Sure. Yeah. 
But uh, Mount those Shasta. Guys, those guys, those guys went on the highway patrol back in the '60s with me, and we're all retired. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. You know? So they're just they're just re, they're just recounting old memories of their days when they worked up there. Absolutely. And uh, the Mount Shasta, I mean, if you go to BigfootEncounters.com and you go into the California uh, Encounters area, listeners can definitely do that. Um, there's some wild encounters from Mount Shasta. That whole region, if you look into it, you could just go rabbit trails upon rabbit trails of hidden treasure and Bigfoot and people disappearing there's up on the mountain. There's a lot of stories. Yeah. There's a lot of stories about the Sasquatch that live in the mountain. Really? You know, I don't know how, I don't know how they transport themselves back and forth from inside to outside. I don't know, but there are, you know, the Indians tell the Indians that live up in that area, uh, tell stories, I guess, of, um, you know, of these creatures that, uh, live in the mountain. That is true. Crazy, crazy. There is a whole, uh, th- there is a, uh, supposedly a whole, uh, civilization that lives inside, uh, Mount Shasta. I've always wanted to talk to someone who's had encounters there. If you're listening and you have experienced stuff around Mount Shasta, reach out to me, please. Um, Mr. Black, this has been incredible. There are, there's a question I like to ask now, and I, I ask this to everyone. It's a left field one, but um, and it doesn't have to do with Bigfoot, but sometimes it hits, sometimes it doesn't. In your experience in California, all the other places you've been, have you ever heard of anyone seeing any creatures that would look like a hyena? Look like a what? Like a hyena. A hyena? Yeah. No. Okay, cool. All right. Um, oh, I mean like a dog man or something like that? Uh, yeah, some people would call it a dog man, but some people actually are seeing what they're saying looks like an actual African hyena. No, you know, there's, I know I've listened to some podcasts where some uh, game wardens and some forestry people uh, shot one of those things uh, with a forty five three times and it had no effect on that thing. It just, it just kind of snarled at them and then just kind of ran off. I, 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 I've read about them. I've heard them talk about on a podcast. I have never, I don't know anybody that's ever seen anything like that. And I, I've never seen anything like that myself. Mm. It's weird stuff. Uh, some people have seen them, some, some haven't, but you never know what's, what's out there in the woods. Uh, you've had it just an Sounds incredible. Like Skinwalker Ranch stuff. It, oh man, if you've looked into Skinwalker Ranch, then you, you know about the supposed dire wolves and the uh, Bigfoot going through the portals out there. And I mean, there's some wild history in that area for sure. Um, yeah, now they're, now they're drilling down, they drill down in part of the ranch and they hit something and about 90 feet or something, they hit something metallic. It's, it's weird stuff for sure. In the Lake County, California area, were there any other Mm -hmm. uh, events of high strangeness that would happen uh, besides Bigfoot that you noticed, or was Bigfoot the main thing that was happening out there in Lake County? That was, I, I never knew anybody that had an encounter. They, if there was other people that had an encounter, nobody was talking to me about it. Mm. And the only the only three people that I know that ever saw anything like that was my brother, um, who was killed in a oil well explosion in Wyoming in 1978, mm. and then my friend Jack that died about uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, and he was too just too sick and too ill to even talk about it. I was really hoping that I was could have a conversation with him, but by the I didn't I didn't know that he was I didn't know that he was uh, as sick as he was, and so you know I was uh, I kind of lost an opportunity there to kind of go down memory lane about you know because people see things differently, 
you know, exactly. and maybe there, and I was, and I was hoping that he would have noticed some features of that creature that I, I didn't see, you know, and, um, uh, I was mostly focused on the face and this thing grinning at us. It was creepy. That really creeped us out when that thing just looked at us and, uh, it came within about 50 or 75 feet from us. And we were, we were on a ranch road, but separating us from the orchard was a drainage ditch that was about, I want to say about maybe 20 feet wide and about 15 or 16 feet deep. We felt pretty comfortable that this thing wasn't going to jump over there and get us. And, uh, and, and again, it, it never made any, any movement uh, aggressive movement at all. It just, it just looked over at these three little kids, these, you know, three teenage kids and just grinned and just kept on going. It, it, it never slowed down. And matter of fact, it, as a, as a, as it went up to the top of the hill and went over the other side, it picked up speed, a lot of speed. I never seen anything run. I never saw anything run, uh, run like that. I mean, this thing, this thing was keeping up with the pickup and, uh, I just, I, it, it, it was, uh, it was something, uh, you know, all these years I've, you know, I can, I can just picture it in my mind. It really had a lasting effect on me and I, and I forgot about it. I kind of put it away in my mind for a long, long time and, uh, and, uh, never, because, you know, if I didn't hear anybody else talking about it, I wasn't going to be the first to talk about it because, you know, people would just, I, I didn't want to be the brunt of a bunch of jokes, you know, and, um, and I think my dad was interested in it, especially after he read the uh, True Magazine article, but I thought for sure that when those two slabs of pork were taken off the back rafters of our house. I, I thought, I thought for sure my dad would probably, you know, put two and two together, but it didn't seem like, didn't seem like he did. He just kind of dismissed it. It was just a mystery that he couldn't solve. And, uh, and I, and, and the, in the back there were that, where the, where they hung the meat, it was, it was concrete. And then uh, my mom's clothesline was back there and that was all gravel. So there were no, there were no footprints that we could see. So, yeah, we just kind of struck out that way. Was that, was that time that you saw the Bigfoot in Lake County? Was that the weirdest thing that you've seen in your life then I would imagine? Oh yeah. No yeah. Doubt. That that's, that's, that's number one. <laughs> You know, and, and, you know, um, I, I remember three or four years ago, I live in Tennessee, middle Tennessee. Now uh, we've lived here back uh, in Tennessee here for about 16 years and I wanted to buy a pickup and, um, I found one in West Virginia. And so when I get, when I drove up to West Virginia with my wife to pick up my truck, I saw as I was, as I was driving through West Virginia, I was, I was all these stories that I'd heard on these podcasts about all the Bigfoot sightings that they see in uh, West Virginia. I was looking down in every, every holler. I was looking all over. I was, I was, I was just uh, looking all over the countryside. I was sure, I was sure that I was going to see a Bigfoot up there, but. No, I didn't see any Bigfoot up there either, but I guess that's Bigfoot country up there, that in Ohio and Washington and Oregon. Well, that in, I mean, some of the the craziest reports I've ever taken have been from middle Tennessee. It's, it's pretty wild. I mean, I would, I would keep my eyes out uh, where you are. You'll probably hear some crazy stuff uh, someday if you listen to people talking in the right areas for sure, but. There's a guy that lives in Nashville. His name is Dave, uh, Dave Eller. 
and he uh, is a he's a Bigfoot uh, investigator, and he draws a 100 mile circle around Nashville, and he talks about all the craziness that he sees out in these woods. Um, I live in Putnam County, and I've looked at the BFRO a website, another website to see where, if there's any uh, Bigfoot uh, sightings in Putnam County. It's a pretty large county here in Middle Tennessee, and we're surrounded by hundreds of thousands of acres of just undeveloped uh, forest land. And there are no uh, sightings uh, in, in Putnam County, but if you go south of Putnam County, uh, into uh, White County and um, Warren County, then you start seeing uh, uh, on these uh, Bigfoot maps where people have seen uh, and spotted these creatures out there. We're Hopefully this will uh, connect. So, sorry about that. We had some weird tech issues come out of nowhere, but uh, yeah, we're back. Sorry about that, sir. Yeah, Tennessee's got its fair share over in the Smoky Mountains. You know, there's, uh, you know, Dave Polites, he's written over there in his 411 books about, you know, you know, little children, you know, out in the field playing under the supervision of their parents. They look away for a second or two, and next thing you know, their kids are gone, and there's not a trace. Mm. They mount a big manhunt, and nobody can find them. Yeah, the whole Dennis Martin case is wild. I believe that's probably what it you're is, referring to. You know, now. so it, it it leads me to believe that these creatures can can camouflage and hide in plain sight. You know, people think they may be looking at a tree or a stump or a rock or a bush, you know, and they just don't know what they're looking at. And they can't, uh, you know, some strange, some strange stuff is, uh, there's a lot of things about this this earth that uh, we can't explain oh i i agree did along the rest of your life did you ever get to a point where you're like you know what i'm actually going to go out and look for bigfoot myself or was there no desire ever to do that no i was i'm i'm i was gonna um uh, i was gonna try to track down uh, uh dave eller down here in nashville to see if i could go out with him wherever he goes and, um, and see if we can, uh, come up with, with some encounters. And, um, because I don't know if the Sasquatch critters that they're seeing in this neck of the woods look anything like what, uh, you know, we, we, I saw out in California. I know the stuff they see down in the, in the big thicket parts of Texas, they look more like, uh, you know, gr apes. Mm -hmm. They got the face of an ape, I Absolutely. guess. Yeah. And yeah, so they're, you know, and they're reporting that some of these creatures have three toes, four toes, five toes. You know, so I don't know if that's interbreeding problems. I don't know what causes that, you know, and, um, and I was going to, I was going to say to you that, uh, there's a there's a mountain resort in eastern Tennessee called um, McLeod Mountain, McLeod Mountain Lodge. And for a few years back, my wife and I took my wife to that lodge. It sits up on top of this mountain, and you can look out over Norris Lake and all. It's pretty close to the Kentucky border. And uh, so we spent the night up there. It's really a beautiful, beautiful place and uh, beautiful rooms, great food. So the next day when we left, as we, I noticed that I didn't see, I didn't really pay any attention when we pulled into the, into the compound where this lodge is, but it's got about a 14 foot uh, wall all around the, the, uh, the, the lodge. And I thought that is kind of, why would they have a, like a 12 or 14 foot wall, high wall around, around this place? That just, 
and on the and on the face of the of the of the lodge on the on the part of the, all the buildings where all the windows are it's just a sheer drop off of just hundreds and hundreds of feet you know so it's it sits right on the edge of this cliff so anyway we're we're leaving the the lodge i notice the the walls makes me wonder and as i go through the the uh, exit i see this little sign and by the way, there's no on the on the road that goes from this little town of Lafoyette or something like that, all the way to the top of the mountain. Nobody lives up there. You got to go clear the top of the mountain before you see two or three cabins plus this lodge. And that's it. There's just there's not there's nothing up there hardly. Just a few little cabins. So anyway, we go out the gate on our way home. I see this sign. It says something like uh, overlook or something like that. And it's got an arrow pointing to the right. So I thought, okay, well, we'll go, let's go drive over and see what this overlook looks like. So we drive out there about a half a mile and the, the paved road starts to get pretty iffy. And then it goes to dirt. And then it goes, it got to the point where it was actually a four wheel drive road. So I keep going and I finally find this, this place called the overlook. And it, it's a part of the top of this mountain. It is solid granite. And, uh, and, and I'm not sure who did it, but they built all these uh, wooden uh, walkways with, uh, with handrails all over the top of the, of this top of this, uh, of this granite kind of part of the top of this mountain. And it was about, I would say that the, the area that this walkway covered was uh, maybe three or four acres, pretty good size. So anyway, we get, we, we take some pictures and we get back in the truck and we're headed back out to the road that goes down that mountain. When, and my wife is looking at her Facebook page and sending pictures to all her friends. And, so I'm driving out here and I just, I was going really slow because it's, I had to be in four wheel drive to get out of this thing, big deep ruts and all this stuff. And I looked off to my left and I, and I see a tree formation that just looks odd. So I stop and back up and I look at it and I thought, this looks like a Sasquatch trail marker that I've read about. So I got out and I walked over to it and um, there was a, there was a, a, a footpath, pretty well worn footpath that went from the area next to the road, this dirt road, four wheel drive road. And it kind of went up the, up the side of this really steep part of the hill. I don't, I don't think I could have walked up it. Uh, it was that steep. But it was well worn. It had a lot of foot traffic on it, and uh, and so right next to this path, there was a sapling, a pine sapling about, I want to say about three inches in diameter, and about from where the tree came out of the ground up to where it had been twisted and then snapped. And I looked at that and I thought that doesn't happen in nature. And I looked around at other trees, and there are no other, no other damaged trees next to it at all. And then down below it, about five or six feet, there was another sapling that was about, I want to say the tree was about 25, maybe, maybe 30 feet long. And it had been bent into an arc. And then the top of the tree was jammed down into the, into the ground. And then there was, uh, there was nothing else holding the tree. It was just the top of the tree jammed into the dirt, and it, and it held that tree in a perfect arc. That doesn't happen in nature either. That's some, so, that is some wild stuff. Wow. Yep. Yeah, so I got home. I got home uh, later that. It's about a two-and-a-half-hour drive over there from where we live. 
And it's all just really little bitty farms here and there, really, really old farm buildings. Some of them built on uh, uh, rock foundations. Have you ever seen that where they build build the old houses way back in the 1800s? They, they, the foundation is so they built they, they put the wooden structure on top of rocks. They use that for a foundation. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've I've seen that. Out yeah, you see. Yeah. Okay, yeah, we've yeah. all seen that stuff. Yeah. So anyway, that's kind of what's back there. Wow. And these little towns are kind of small, and you know, so it's it's just kind of remote up there on top of McLeod Mountain. So anyway, I drive home, and the next day I get on the computer. And I track down this uh, guy, uh, Bob Strain, and I come up with his wife, Kathy Strain, and it tells all about her. But she's an anthropologist. She works for the U.S. Department of Forestry. And when they, when they are in the National Forest and they come upon Indian remains, then that's her bailiwick. She works with the Indian tribes to do whatever the Indian tribe wants, wants to do with those bones, you know, take them someplace, bury them someplace, you know, re rebury them. I don't know, whatever they do, but that's, but because of, because of her uh, job and because she's out in the forest all the time um, in pretty remote parts of the California forest, uh, she, she's come into contact with these things. And, uh, so she was, so I call, so I, I sent her, uh, a messenger. I didn't know what her phone number was. I didn't know what her email address was, but I, I found her on, on uh, Facebook and messenger. So I sent her, I sent her a picture of this thing. And I said, what is this? And she wrote right back within maybe half an hour or so and said, oh, that's a Sasquatch trail marker. Where is that? And I said, McLeod mountain in East Tennessee. And she said, yep, they're just tr marking the trail. And uh, so that's kind of what, so as I drive around Tennessee, and I'm a motorcyclist, even at, I'm 79 and I'm still riding the motorcycles, you know. But uh, I, I rode them all my life on the highway patrol, had them as I was a kid, can't get motorcycles out of my, out of my blood. So we got, we got beautiful backcountry roads here. The, the roads are well paved. They go out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I'm always looking for any kind of, of, of tree structure that just looks odd. The, the road that I live on has about 12 houses on it. And it's about mm, not quite a mile long and it dead ends. It dead ends up the up the hill from me, and from that point on, it's about fifteen thousand acres of nothing but undeveloped woods. The only thing that goes through that fifteen thousand acres is an underground pro high pressure propane line that goes from Nashville to Knoxville, and it's buried underground. But there's a big clearing. On you know, so they can have access to go in there and work on that line if they have to. And I take my four wheeler, and I go back in there, and uh, I have looked all over that place back there looking for any kind of weird signs of anything, and I I have yet to find it. But um, I'm gonna dig up uh, Dave Eller's. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can figure out how to get a hold of him. I know that they just had a Bigfoot conference down in McMinnville, yep. which is about yep. an hour and 20 minutes from my house. And I didn't know it or I would have been there because Eller was there. Um, who's the guy with the Sierra sounds? Ron, Ron Moorhead. Moorhead. Yep. Ron Moorhead. Ron Moorhead. He was there. And a bunch of other people were there. Oh, you're talking about the Tennessee and, uh, wild man conference. Yeah, it just happened just that a few days ago. That was supposedly it was over phenomenal. The yeah, that, there are a lot of really, you need to go next year if if you can make it because the people there are all fantastic people. I've met a lot of them and they are just great individuals. These aren't people that are delusional. No. You know, these aren't people making up stories, you know. 
Ron Moorhead tells some pretty spooky stories about where they he was up there with those people and they they went inside this tree or something. And somebody it wasn't them that made it, but it was already there. And they went up and it was kind of like this camping spot up in the Sierra Mountains, and they were back miles and miles back in there. And almost immediately when they got back there, they heard tree knocks and, and whooping and hollering and, and carrying on all night until it got down, it got down right in their campsite. And they took refuge in this hollowed out tree. And somebody had created this uh, uh, out of logs or something that were chained together. They could make their make this little fortress in this hollowed out tree and they all got in there to protect themselves because I guess there was some pretty aggressive, uh, stuff going on out in their campsite. And, uh, that's some pretty spooky stuff, but do you believe that our government knows all about these creatures? Oh, totally. Absolutely. They know more about these. They know more about these things than any, anybody on the planet. Probably. I, I wouldn't I'm be sure surprised if they actually got one in captivity. <laughs> uh, dude, I've heard some wild stuff and it's like, if there's all the UFO stuff and that that's coming out, you know, that, I mean, you hear all these stories about stuff around bases or sightings on bases in certain areas, you know that there's there's yes. got to be some Bigfoot that are um, in. Some people even think that the Bigfoot stuff is related to the UFO stuff uh, coming out. And I mean, that's an interesting well, you see viewpoint. All these orbs, yeah. these, these, these light orbs in the, in the forest, you know, and uh, they see all this kind of stuff. And uh, you wonder what the heck is that stuff, you know? It's it's very it, very interesting because there's no right or wrong answers, and it's like every answer you find leads to ten different questions. And yeah, it's it's crazy stuff. You know the the Indians. You know they've they've had relationships with the uh, Kathy String's got this book, and I'm uh, got a couple of books. I'm I'm gonna go on Amazon and see if I can find them, and uh, and uh, because all her all those encounters that she writes about are just the stories told to her by the Indian tribes, the Lakota and the, you know, and the Navajo and the Apache and, and uh, all those folks. And I, I think it was either the Navajo or the Apache drove them out of Arizona and um, drove them back up, up, up in, you know, up in the Northern Utah and up in there. but. You know, there's, I mean, I've, I've listened to so many credible podcasts where, you know, these, um, these helicopter pilots and their observers are out flying, flying these big power lines just to make sure that, you know, tree limbs or branches or debris aren't, you know, uh, interfering with the transmission lines. And they're out in the middle of nowhere, you know, uh, out in places that would take you a day or two to hike into. And here's a here's a here's a male Sasquatch, mama Sasquatch, and baby Sasquatch, just out there in the middle of nowhere. And uh, and in some cases, these things will stand their ground. Others, other times, they just run away. It's, you know, it's, it's wild uh, stuff. It's mysterious. It's, it it's is. mysterious. And uh, this guy, Ron, the Dave Eller down here in Nashville, I, I, I've I listened to him on uh, YouTube uh, when he's, and he seems to be pretty fearless. And um, he was talking about uh, on a podcast I listened to recently. He was talking about some place uh, east, uh, uh, west of uh, Nashville, out in the out in the the woods, uh, north of Interstate 40, and he came to this place. He called it a glade, 
and it's just a place in the forest where the where the floor of the floor of the of the forest is just solid stone. It's just out in the middle of the forest. Nothing grows there. And he's had a lot of encounters in those areas. And um, so I, you know, I tried to look up to see if there was any any map on inter, on the internet that showed where some of these glades might 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 exist, but I couldn't find anything. But um, he's had some pretty pretty. And there's another place where a lot of uh, Bigfoot sightings uh, land between the lakes. Yes, in Kentucky. Which is over. Yeah. Yeah, it's, part of it's in Tennessee, part of it's in Kentucky. Mm-hmm. It's where the, the lakes were formed back in the 1800s when they had this big earthquake and the Mississippi River reversed uh, course and created these lakes. And uh, yeah, I even read that it said that the that the um, the, the that the uh, uh, earthquake was so severe that it rang the Liberty Bell in, in, in Philadelphia. Now, I don't know about that. Oh, that's pretty, that's a wild one. But that same area that's is... That's a wild one. It's pretty heavy with uh, dogman sightings as well, the whole land between the lakes area. Yeah, Judy and I went in there. We were on our way back from... Um, shit. Uh, some camping trip out, in the, out maybe in South Dakota somewhere. And we, we came through there. And we were going to, we, and, uh, we spent the night there in this campground in the land between the lakes. It is an unusual place. And, uh, but that was, but I wasn't into Bigfoot. I wasn't looking for anything at that time and, uh, wasn't thinking about that. But later on, when I started listening to this Dave Eller guy, then I thought, wow, they got a lot of, a lot of sightings over there. And, um, but you got to go out and, uh, you got to get away from people and, uh, where people normally go. And then you'll, I guess you'll run into these things. I don't know. Oh, but absolutely. I mean, you got to get back, back out in the nature and who knows what, what you'll find. So be prepared. But Mr. Black, this has been a awesome chat. It's gone places that I wasn't expecting it to go. And I'm glad it went to all the places it did, but uh, thank you so much for contacting me. And I hope that you, uh, you stay in touch and um, uh, with any other interesting things that, that happen in the next coming years. I've got some friends that uh, are retired from the patrol in California and they live down here in Warren County. And they live out in the middle of nothing. And uh, I'm going to, I haven't seen these guys for a couple of months. And I'm going to, I'm going to see if those guys have seen anything that they're just keeping to themselves, you know? There you go. And uh, because they decided that they were going to be, you know, they're going to raise some chickens and they're going to have a goat or two, you know, and that kind of thing. And I can't think of anything that might make a, a, a good meal than a chicken or a goat, you know, mm-hmm. for some of these, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and I've, and a lot of my friends here hunt and uh, you know, I think a lot of the people that see these Bigfoot are hunters and the most fascinating stories to me are told by hunters who really, really tell some kind of bone chilling stories about these these critters and how some of those guys have shot those things and they just run off they they don't die they they're shooting them with seven millimeter mags they're shooting them with all kinds of 30 odd sixes and uh they can see the round go through this thing they can see a tree bark or something fly as a bullet goes through them and these things scream and yell and carry on and just run off and you know, never to be found again. It's just, I, I, I don't know if you can kill these things or not, you know? It, you know, it, it's, it's wild. I, you know, who knows, maybe someday someone will, we'll see. But uh, if you ever run into, you know, any of, 
anyone you're talking to that has any other interesting things to report as well, you can always feel free to pass on my information. I'd love to talk to them uh, as well. But I'll do that. I know that the other night I was listening to this podcast and these two truck drivers, hum, husband and wife are going up, up some, they were in Minnesota and they were traveling along this road up that kind of parallel the Mississippi river. And they see this black Hawk, Hawk helicopter hovering just above the tree line. And as they continue to drive along in their truck, wherever they were going to deliver freight, why this black Hawk, uh kind of uh increases its elevation and uh and there's a big cable hanging below the helicopter and below that is a huge white bag that's attached to the cable to the attached to the bottom of the um uh, of helicopter and within just a few minutes of them seeing that both their cell phones rang and it was an and it was a uh, and there was um, uh, a message that said we want to talk to you. And they said they just they just deleted the message from their voice message and they just kept on driving. Now that's creepy. That's that's some wild stuff. You never know what's going to happen for sure. It's crazy. You got to well, anyway, keep your eyes good, open. It's good. Good. Good talking to you. And uh, thanks for taking the time to uh, listen to my crazy, uh, crazy story. You got it, Mr. Black. Keep in touch, sir. Thank you for chatting tonight. Hey, good night and have a good one. Here at Bigfoot Society, our goal is to provide a platform for those that have encountered Bigfoot to share their encounter in a safe and respected environment. But we need to hear your story. If you've experienced something that you just can't explain, please send me an email at BigfootSociety at gmail.com. Then we can start the conversation. I know a lot of you have not shared your encounter at all it's been 20 years and it's time that you get this off your chest and then you can get some well-deserved rest because i know you haven't been sleeping i understand what you're going through and i appreciate every one of you listening